In other words, what we have in here now is liquid helium-1, the warmer of the two phases. Before we cool it down, to take a look at the superfluid phase, I want to dwell briefly on the properties of helium-1. I have told you before that even helium-1 is different from the normal liquids. The distance between neighboring atoms in this liquid is quite large. The atoms are not as closely packed as in the classical liquids. The reason for this is quantum mechanical. The zero-point energy is relatively more important here than in any other liquid. As a consequence, liquid helium has a very low mass density, only about 13% the density of water, and a very low optical density. The index of refraction is quite close to 1. This makes its surface hard to see with the naked eye under ordinary lighting conditions. You are no doubt familiar with the fact that the helium atom has closed shell atomic structure. This explains why helium is a chemically inert element. It also accounts for the fact that the force of attraction between neighboring helium atoms, the so-called van der Waals force, is small. It takes little energy to pull two helium atoms apart, as for example in evaporation. This gives liquid helium a very small latent heat of vaporization. Only five calories are needed to evaporate one gram. Compare this with water, where evaporation requires between five and six hundred calories per gram. The low van der Waals force, combined with a large zero-point energy, also account for the fact that liquid helium does not freeze, cannot be solidified at ordinary pressures, no matter how far we cool it. However, liquid helium has been solidified at high pressure. The liquid helium in the Dewar is at 4.2 degrees. We now want to cool it down to the lambda point and show you the transition to the superfluid phase. Our method will be cooling by evaporation using a vacuum pump. Now, the lambda point lies at 2.2 degrees, only 2 degrees colder than the present temperature of the liquid. What's more, not very much heat has to be removed from the liquid helium now in the doer to bring it to the lambda point. It amounts to only about 250 calories. Nevertheless, don't get the idea that this cooling process is easy. On the contrary, it's quite difficult. More than one-third of the liquid helium now in the doer has to be pumped away in vapor form before we can get what remains behind to the lambda point. That requires an awful lot of pumping and explains why we use this large and powerful vacuum pump over here. Even with this pump, the cooling process takes a considerable amount of time. why it is so difficult to cool liquid helium to the lambda point. I have already mentioned that liquid helium has a remarkably small heat of vaporization, only five calories per gram. At the same time, liquid helium at 4.2 degrees has a high specific heat, almost one calorie per gram. Therefore, one gram of the vapor pumped away carries with it an amount of heat which can cool only five or six grams of liquid helium by one degree. 
That's not very much cooling. It is less by a factor of almost a hundred than when we cool water by evaporation. The situation gets even worse as cooling progresses below 4.2 degrees because the specific heat of liquid helium rises astonishingly as we approach 2.17 degrees, the lambda point. The heat of vaporization, on the other hand, remains roughly the same. So, a given amount of vapor carried off produces less and less cooling as we approach 2.17 degrees. Our thermometer here is a low pressure gauge connected to the space above the liquid helium. The needle registers the pressure there. It is the saturated vapor pressure of liquid helium. The gauge is calibrated to the corresponding temperature. We call it a vapor pressure thermometer. As we approach 2.17 degrees, boiling becomes increasingly violent. Suddenly it stops. This was the transition. The liquid you now see is helium-2. Even though evaporation does continue, there is no boiling. Normal liquids, such as the water in this beaker, boil because of their relatively low heat conductivity. Before heat, added at one point, can be carried away to a cooler place in the liquid, bubbles of the vapor form. Helium-1 behaves like a normal liquid in this respect. The absence of boiling in helium-2 reveals that this phase acts as if it had a large heat conductivity. As a matter of fact, as the liquid helium passed through the lambda point transition you just saw, its heat conductivity increased by the fantastic factor of one million. The heat conductivity of helium-2 is many times greater than in the metals silver and copper, which are among the best solid heat conductors. And yet, here we deal with a liquid. For this alone, helium-2 deserves the name of superfluid. Actually, the way in which helium-2 transports such large quantities of heat so rapidly is totally different from the classical concepts for heat conduction. I'll come back to the subject later in connection with an experiment demonstrating the phenomenon of second sound in helium-2. Remember that this great change in heat conductivity occurs at a single, a fixed transition temperature, the lambda point. We do indeed deal with a change in phase, only here it is a change from one liquid to another liquid. As we've told you before, the specific heat of liquid helium is very large at the lambda point. In fact, it behaves abnormally even below the lambda point and falls again very rapidly with the temperature. This discontinuity in specific heat is another reflection of the fact that we are dealing with a change in the phase of the substance. By the way, the curve resembles the Greek letter lambda. The transition temperature got its name from the shape of this curve.